Thank you, Nick. That is fantastic. And thank you for your time coming today. I always count it a privilege to come and uh, share and uh, talk about one of the most important things on all of our hearts, growing the kingdom and our church, which yeah. is the kingdom. Yeah. And uh, I have a passion to see churches uh, grow and be viable in all that God's called them to be. So uh, this is going to be interesting. Uh, Nick set you up here very well. This is very good. Thank you, Nick and Karen, and inviting me to come. It's fantastic. Um, and uh, be involved in what we're talking about. Um, some of the things I'm going to share with you today, uh, it's really weird. To me, they seem very obvious um, because I've been on a journey um, for probably 33 years now. Um, great to see Fraser Hardy here. Fraser and I used to play rugby together. Um, he got sick of getting beaten by us in our church, so we jo joined churches and beat everyone else. <laughs> Not quite true. No, Fraser's an awesome guy and got a great church. So we go back a long time. Of course, Nick, um, we're trying to recount when we first met. I think it was Faith Bible College. I was a young Turk that they used to get to go in there and lecture and stir things up. And Nick was there, and I think, were you there then, Karen? And uh, John from Kildy, who is now in our movement in Australia, and a lot of people over the years, you know. And it's really interesting on the journey together. Um, good to see Noel here. Noel and I go back to the race course in Palmerston North when I was on the band playing with the Garretts and I had long hair. I don't know why they even they had me because I was always in trouble. They, Dave and Dale always telling me off. Play it straight, Gordon. Stop trying to funk it up, you know. Just play it straight, you know. And uh, it was, they were great days. So I started my journey really not as a leader. Um, and my research and journey in this has actually discovered I've had a lot of light bulb experiences, and I hope to share with you a few light bulbs to, today, okay? And uh, even if you don't get them today, as you continue to pray and talk through it and work through it, I trust you'll have some light bulb experiences. I've had quite a few. I think I need them, you know. Uh, we don't necessarily get it all together. But one of the revelations I got really early in the piece was I wasn't a good leader. I was a great minister. I think I actually developed, like most pastors, a pretty proficient skill set of ministry. Get me up to song lead, you know, candy from a kid. You know, it's familiar territory. I, was, I started out as a musician, and so I gave myself to learning how to lead people into worship and to bring the presence of God. And, and I've loved that. I wish I was do it, still doing it, but, you know, I wouldn't be good enough now. That's the problem. But, um, um, you know, I used to love that. And um, I then developed youth uh, communication skills and ended up the youth leader, so-called, or youth pastor in our church. But I don't think I was the youth leader at all. Um, but I knew how to minister to them. Eventually, I became a pastor on staff and um, in the church in Palmerston North with Ken Wright and all the guys, you know. And anyway, so I, I knew how to visit. I, I reckon I developed a pretty good bedside manner in the hospital. Um, I developed pretty good preaching skills from quite an early age. From the time I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, before I was saved, I had a speech impediment. And when I got filled with the Spirit and speaking in tongues, I got healed. And I found I could just get up like this and talk, which was not normal for me. I remember the first time my mum and dad saw me preach, they, they'd kinda, they had to pick their jaws off the floor. They couldn't believe it because I just got up and I found it happened. Um, so I developed a whole set of um, ministry skills. And, uh, of course, I was brought up in the, I came to Christ in the Jesus movement and in the charismaniac, oh, sorry, the charismatic movement. <laughs> And uh, what great days they were. Yeah. But I think actually they've done the church, uh, with everything there's an upside or downside, isn't there? The upside, gifts were released, people got free, you know, etc. Downside, I think we've, left a, we've been left a legacy of what I call ministry-itis. And so by and large the church is so focused ministry-wise leadership often is spurned or held with quite a lot of suspicion. 
So the moment someone exercises leadership, we have a whole lot of feelings go off in us. Now, not off us in this room, because I'm singing to the choir. I hope I am. But um, in the church, we have a whole lot of theology. So when a guy leads, then he's controlling. Um, he's roughshodding over people. He's a one-man band. What about the eldership? What about plurality? What about servant leader? Uh, what about whatever? But the moment someone ministers now, what a wonderful ministry. So, so uh, we've had to change terminology. Like, for instance, I've always believed and brought up that you go into the ministry. But then I got a revelation one day, a light bulb experience. No, you're not called to the ministry. You're called to the leadership. So I actually... I'm actually in the leadership, not in the ministry. Now, I do minister, but my primary role is leader. So I'm there to lead. And then I found out how ill-equipped I was to lead. And because uh, I've always been in a team environment, a ministry environment, where leadership actually in our culture um, was actually not held in high regard. As a matter of fact, it was actually we set up a whole other thing in our church that I came from, uh, one group of churches at one time called us this eight-headed monster, <coughs> which is actually quite wrong because it wasn't eight heads, it was about a hundred. <laughs> and everyone had a say, and we were plural, we were co-equal, and it was a nightmare, an absolute nightmare. And I had to get out of that myself emotionally and in practice. So when I started to lead, I always felt guilty because I, I didn't come from a framework that um, set me up to lead, uh, which was a really interesting journey. So the reason I'm saying this is, things I say today, you can't just go and go, that's what we're going to do. There's a, you've got to understand there's a journey in this. Um, so what happened was I migrated finally to Australia, and everyone you know, said, Gordon, it's going to be awesome, you're going to do it, we believe in you. And so I thought, well, if they do, that's good. You know, and away I went with my wife and four kids and one, uh, one Aussie. And so I came from a church of around about, when I left Palmerston, probably seven, eight, nine hundred people. And then I end up in Australia with seven people. And I felt devastated. I remember standing once in front of these seven or eight people thinking, what am I doing here? You know, anyone relate to that? Um, and so I just knew I'd committed, so I knew I had to begin the journey, and I began the journey, and away we went, and that was 21 years ago. And now I'm actually the longest standing pastor, the longest serving pastor in our whole region, um, which is really interesting. I find it quite interesting which is another whole subject of pastoral longevity, but anyway, we won't go there. Um, and uh, so uh, I just started to flow with the church and do the journey of growing into an actual leader of a church rather than a minister of a church. And I found that quite interesting. About five years ago, Pastor Phil Pringle asked me to be the leader of our denomination, which I found really interesting. I wondered how the Aussies would react to that. Uh, you know, and, and then how we, it's been awesome. It's just been, they've been so generous and wonderful. So I began to mentor and oversee churches, and we started that journey. And then I discovered all these pastors that are stuck. Some pastors do really well, others give up and move on and do something else. And then I discovered a whole lot of pastors that are just really great people, like doing great things, but they're stuck. Their church is stuck. And I got a real passion for it. I thought, God, how can we help these pastors go to the next level? And so I start, that's what got me going. I got a bit angry, actually, because I saw really good people burning out. I saw people, not just in our movement, but pastors that I began talking with, and they, they didn't know where to go. And I sort of got this prayer happening in me. Do I know anything that I can help these guys with, Lord? How can I articulate it? 
And then out of that comes this whole journey of what that book you've got in front of you, um, levels and styles of leadership. And what I discovered was this, because my own journey. The strong natural leaders don't necessarily make the best pastors or leaders of a church. That was incredible. I actually found that a lot of pastors who are successful in leading their churches into growth are often not natural leaders at all. And if you've done any research and looked at books on like NCD or the Natural Church Development, which has become a standard tool for every church in our movement now, I make it a mandatory thing that every church ought to be doing this, not every year, but as a regular checkup. Well, in there, he, he takes the whole approach of health, right? And he comes up with the eight characteristics of a healthy church, and one of them is empowering leadership. What I've discovered is leadership isn't about powerful leaders. It's about empowering leaders. So a powerful leader is a person who stirs the emotions, gathers the troops, and leads the charge. But an empowering leader is a leader who empowers other people. And there's a huge difference. And I see it in the difference between the Moses style of leadership and the Joshua style of leadership. The Moses generation leader is the powerful leader. We need bread. Down it comes. We need meat. Quail, you know. We need water. Strike the rock. You know, he's the man of God. He's the moment. He's the powerful leader. And everyone follows him. Right? But when he goes up to the mountain, they revert back to paganism and build a golden calf. Because when you follow a powerful leader, it all revolves around him or her. Right? An empowering leader is a Joshua. He didn't stand up in front and go, waters of the J J um, Jordan be parted. He said, priests, you get an order. And he brought order and empowerment to the priestly ministry. And he says, you go first. And then the commanders. And then he, he didn't even lead it. I've got the feeling that on some campaigns, you might not have picked that he was actually the leader. But leadership was happening because it was empowering leader. So Moses leads from the front as a powerful figure and people follow. Joshua says, you go. So when they come to the land, he chooses 12 uh, spies and he sends them in. And he stays here. Having a cup of coffee, you know, and a muffin. So he doesn't look like the powerful leader, not like Moses. You see what I'm trying to say? But he conquers the whole land by empowering other people. So that was a kind of like a biblical theological thing of it. And so I began to then write this down and discuss it with my contemporaries and lecture it a bit and talk about it and test it and bring my own journey into it. And then I had another light bulb experience. And it's simply this. Breaking through to the next level is a simple thing of changing your style, the way you lead. See, we, we go to ministry every time. So if you're a prayer and you have a problem in the church or with your board or with the finance, you go to a 40-day fast and you seek God for the money and the breakthrough and the, get rid of that board member and whatever. Right? If you're a preacher and got a great gift of teaching, you go to the pulpit and you use the pulpit to minister to your problem. And I've had to help pastors to say, no, don't talk about it from the pulpit. Because you know, you've got board members sitting there, for example, thinking, did, he, or did I just get my head cut off? Nah, he's a nice bloke. He wouldn't do it publicly without discussing it with me. And the next week, he is getting at me. That mess, the series is about me. <laughs> Straight away, those pastors have lost the respect of those people because he, there's no confrontation and discussion. It's, 
using the ministry to achieve a leadership result. Now, this is a huge light bulb here that I'm giving you, okay? <laughs> so, the, so we, we've got to get to a point where we understand that, A, first light bulb, you don't have to be a great natural leader to lead in an empowering way. Secondly, changing your style can bring immediate results of growth and release in the life of your church. That was huge. So that set me on this journey. And then finally I wrote that book and I saw that every church, no matter where you are, New Zealand, Australia, America, Europe, Asia, wherever, every church in the world, it's just statistically undeniable, can be fitted, 99.5% of all churches worldwide can be fitted into one of four quadrants. And so I come up with a quadrant, we'll talk about it shortly. And then I saw personalities linked to those quadrants, the four personalities. Not as personalities, but as styles. And as I unpack this, I hope it will really help you. And uh, what that means, and God started giving me a whole lot of light bulbs. Then after that, I wrote this book here, going to the next level. So you read that book first, then you read this. And then what this book does, it goes into each size of church and gives practical things that need to be done to bring about change and take the church to the next level. Um, also in there, there is a chapter at the end on 1,000 plus churches, or what is known as today, either positively and negatively, the mega church. They are on the rise. And people say, oh, God's not into big churches. We might have a go at that this afternoon when you like me a bit more. And, um, and then, uh, you know, uh, oh, he, God, they're impersonal and you're just a number and all that. The Christian church better get used to it. Large churches are booming around the world. In New Zealand right now, there's never been more 1,000-plus churches. I cannot remember. I was here 20, 30 years ago. There's probably three or four, maybe two. And now there's, there's probably a dozen or more churches throughout New Zealand that are breaking through. Australia, just in our movement alone, we have eight churches over 1,000, and we've got about another half a dozen on the way that I'm mentoring and bringing through because I'm after a, a kind of church. I'm after an apostolic center yeah. because apostolic centers have the resources, the money, etc. So it's a, just a, an idea that I have. So um, there's a chapter on that. If you're interested in another book I've got, just before I get into this, um, I wrote this book called Blender Families, not Blended Families. This is for, mar for remarriage people who, you know, the Partridge family. Uh, we did a survey in our church because our 12 to 14 year old attendance was, what's the word, sporadic. And so first of all, we looked at the program and then we looked at the resources and the leadership and all that. And one day I said to my daughter who was running it, do a survey for goodness sake, do a profile of all our 12 to 14 year olds. The result shocked me. And then again, it didn't. 42% of the kids in our junior teen program are in broken homes. 42%. I reckon that's going to go up to 50 in the next 5, 10 years. Okay. And so I thought, we've got to do something. Now, the traditional Christian model is, you know, shoot it. But you can't. That's half your church. <laughs> you know. So our job's to help them. Yeah. So we believe the two ways to help them is model great marriages. And then I thought maybe I could put some tools together. So I wrote this book. There's no scriptures in it. It's a self-help book. It's like a tract. And what our church does and what other churches have done is actually do a survey of all the people in the church that are in blended families and remarriage, got saved, you know, coming into the church. And uh, they buy them and give it to them as a gift. Um, other churches have taken, run a seminar like today and used this book and run a seminar on how to run a blended family. Because what that does is you start to unearth problems in their families, which I talk about in the book. Uh, people think, if I just get married, everything will be happy. <laughs> no. It'll be worse. <laughs> you know. And then if you want to really mess it up, have kids. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and so we, we need to help people. And we've got, a, we've got a real problem. I think New Zealand's pretty similar. Yeah. So that's that one. A couple of CDs I've got here for you. 
Um, this one here is on evangelism. We might talk about this this afternoon. I have uh, banned certain words in our church. Evangelism, preaching, crusades, especially, you know, in modern, anyway. Um, right, we talk about unchurched inclusion. What I'm doing in this series is lowering the bar and saying every Christian can do this. But when we say to Christians, you've got to preach the gospel, when people are cry, it's like, uh, 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 uh. So all I talk about is just including unchurched people in your life. And uh, we just talk about that. There are four tapes on or CDs. It's about hospitality, the power of the wow, you know, um, the power of friendliness and the power of wisdom. I talk about those four things are critical to including unchurched because unchurched people won't connect to me if I'm not friendly. And one of the ways to wow anybody, uh, win a person rather, is to wow them. So the other day when I was in Auckland doing our conference there, um, there's a really neat Maori guy on the uh, door of the hotel, dressed every day, immaculate. And man, he took his job serious. Right? I called him a professional doorman, man. I wish I could hire him from a church. I'd actually put him on the door of my church. Okay. And he, every day, man, he was there, picking my bag up, meeting me, and he found out Dr. Moore, even knew who I was. Didn't know, I don't think he thinks I'm a Christian. He probably thinks I'm a, I'm a surgeon or something. But, um, <laughs> and he's there, man, he's looking after me. So I thought, man, this is awesome. So when I left on Monday morning, um, I tipped him. Put a $20 note in my hand, and when I shook hands, I went up to him and I said, mate, that was awesome, and I just shook hands with him. I said, here, take this, mate. And he... It unhinged him, it wowed him, because people don't do that in our culture, right? He's doing his job, right? What does he need a tip for? Anyway, um, so I just wowed him, and then I shook his hand, and I said, mate, I travel all over the world. You're one of the best doormen I've ever seen. He, he, man, I'll tell you what, he just... I, I am, you know? It was awesome, man, you know? And I said, when I come back to Auckland, I'm coming to your hotel, and I'll look for you. Right? You know what's going to happen the day I walk back in that hotel? He will never forget me. Why? Because I wowed him. Right? And evangelism isn't about shoving the gospel down people's throats. It's about just get, bringing them into your world, you know. Um, and then they see who we are. So that's a really powerful series. This one here, Doing God's Business, that tape or CD, I sell the most of. And it's a... It's a CD about we're all doing God's business, whether we're business people, pastors, or whatever. And I talk about the three kinds of people. We're either a worker, a manager, or an owner. And you've got to find out who you are really quick. Otherwise, if you don't, it'll screw your life up totally. So, for instance, a person who's trying to run their own business, but they're a manager, they're never going to have enough money. Right? So what they need to do is sell the business and go and work for someone else earn 100 grand a year and have holidays in Hawaii every year. Because he who excels in his work will stand before great men. And what I found in my church, I had a lot of business guys who were trying to run their own business and they should be working for someone else. So really important, that one there. And then there's our CD, our worship CD. That's our latest worship CD. We're pretty proud of this. It's, going, it's just been translated into Portuguese and Spanish. It's hitting Latin America this month. So we're pretty keen about that. That's been picked up. That's my daughter there. She writes a lot of the songs. Uh, you remember Sonia? She had a little wee when we left. She's now our music pastor with her husband, this guy here, and they do great stuff. So get a hold of those. They're just resources that uh, you can get a hold of there. Fantastic. So you know who I am. Um, I've got four kids, one wife, and six grandchildren. I can show you the photos if you want, but I'm not. No, I'm here to teach, aren't I? So, pretty proud of them. And um, uh, it's, it's just great to be here today. So what I thought I'd do in this time between now and lunch is open it up. You get to know me, and we'll just talk about the overall theory, and then we'll develop it and go through the different stages. Then this afternoon, we might look at um, small church mentality, how to recognize and get rid of it and how to break through um, and talk about that and maybe some leadership dynamics. And then as we go, providing you just don't interrupt me all the time, you know, I don't get a chance to talk. Um, I like people, I like interaction, really keen on it, so that's not just a talking head. If something I say you don't understand 
or you've got a question, right, and you really like to ask on that particular point, just raise your hand, okay? And if I don't like you, we'll just keep moving on, right? <laughs> but obviously you're Jay. Jay, is it? Yep. You're going to have some good questions? Totally, okay? <laughs> Pretty good. And so we'll go that way, okay? I did it yesterday. I do this in a lot of seminars that I do. I just find it gets the thing happening and people's questions as we go along. Other than you leave and you go, I wish I'd asked that question when he said that, you know? So we can just keep it alive, okay? So we're going to go to 12.30, rather, aren't we? So we've got about an hour and a quarter. Are you ready to rock and roll? Yes. Okay, let's do it, baby. So I'll get my coat off, because I think it could get warm in here. A lot of hot air and talking. It's good, isn't it? This is a beautiful day, too. It's great. We're in the Waikato, man. I know that. Okay, so let's talk about this, the leadership styles. And basically what I've come up with, as I mentioned before, a model. It's not like, you, it's not, this is not a thing you go home and do. It's a model to explain what we do. And I hope as we do it, you'll get some light bulbs. Right, okay, okay. Um, the other thing I need to define, because we do talk about the four personalities. You know the four personalities, choleric, sanguine, phlegmatic, melancholy. I am not using that to say... If you're a phlegmatic, you have to be a, a choleric to lead. What I'm talking about is style. I'm using it because what I found in the four quadrants, those four personalities actually typify the style of the church in that quadrant, which is a major light bulb for me. So when I explain it, people go, I, 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 right, I get it. So it's like a parable, if you like. It, it illustrates what we're talking about. Um, so we're not talking about personality or temperament. We're talking about the style or the approach I need to adopt to lead at that level. Right? Um, the other thing that I hope you picked up in my early uh, comments is that leadership styles can be learnt and developed. And that's my journey. My journey is not I started as this great leader and just got about leading. My journey has been like most pastors. I started out helping people with a desire to minister and teach and help and so forth, and I developed leadership style. The other thing that I want to say, which is pretty huge, is we all default to our natural personality. We all think it's God, but in actual fact, we go to where we feel comfort and strength, and we know we can handle it this way. I gave two illustrations before. A friend of mine that was pastoring a church, whenever anything happened and he got into problems, he would fast. And one day I said to him, mate, quit the fasting and the praying and do something, for goodness sake. Your church is hemorrhaging because all you're doing is ostrich. That's what he was doing. He didn't want to confront anything, so he would just seek God. And really genuine. No, nothing wrong with it, but it's not leadership. Okay? Some pastors, you have to say to them, shut up and listen. Don't get in the pulpit and start preaching at your problems. Go to the people that you think have difficulties, sit them down over a cup of coffee and let them talk. And let people communicate. And so we develop communication skill. So it's kind of, this is a real deal. You know, My preference would be if I felt there was a bit of rumbling in the church, I reckon have a happy praise time. So I'd, I'd get involved with the music and I'd get up there and shut my eyes and just get into the presence of God and it gets all healed, right? No. No, it doesn't. People get madder because they go, he's just trying to make me feel good. No, I'm unhappy. You know. So we all default to things. Some of us default to choleric. Naturally, we're strong choleric personalities. Things go wrong, we start shooting people. We come out in the corner like, you know, like wired earth, right? you know, you know, whatever. Others that have me melancholy personality, we get into leadership problems, get all hurt and take it personal, they're against me. Do you know what I found after 38 years in this thing? I've found probably once or twice it was personal. I've actually found most of the time it's not personal. It's not about me. It's about what's happening. But if we default, to our own personality, and we take it all personal, have a guess what the ministry will do to you? It'll kill you. Because right. every day there are reasons to take things personal. Yeah. You know, They're against me. They're attacking me. Rather than, no, this is not about me. 
Now, if it is, tell them to step outside and, and handle it. So let's go and have a talk, you and me, man to man. Right? But if it's not, most of the time it isn't. That's what I've honestly found. I found most people are mad and angry. Yeah, but not at me. They're mad because of something going into their world or they're reacting. There's been an injustice, etc. And so it's really important not to default as a leader, but to say, wait a minute, I'm here to lead. I need to step up to the plate and handle the situation. It's a, it's a totally different thing. It's something I've really learned in my own life defaulting and then wondering why it didn't work. Um, and so we've got to work through that. So here's the quadrants. So if you want to draw on your page, you just draw a circle. Can I use this one here? I can use that, can't I? So if you, if you um, I'll use this as well because I like to squiggle. Um, so if you just draw a circle, um, this is basically the foundation of the whole theory or the model, so you just draw a circle and you just draw it into four quadrants. Okay? Now, remember I said 99.5% of all churches can fit into the, one of these four quadrants. Why is that? Because 99.5% of all churches are less than 1,000 in the world. That's the stat. Not by one research, not just Barna, that's Wagner, Barna, all of them, right? So, you've got in the first quadrant, I've got to do this because I wasn't a mathematician and I've always gotten into trouble with it. Less than 75, correct? So from here to here, the first quadrant, church is less than 75. From here, <coughs> this one is um, 76 to 200. This one, 201 to 500. And this one, 500 to 999, if you like. 99%, 99.5% of all churches fit there. Okay, so the first level is called the birthing level. Birthing, why do, we, why do we say that? Because it's the starting. It's where churches start. One of the problems I see in the body of Christ today is we've got too many churches that are still starting. They've been going... 50 years and they're still starting. They've never broken 75. And that can be a very frustrating zone to get into. And we've tried to help a lot of pastors in that. Then the second zone is what we call the establishing. In other words, once a church breaks through about 100, 150 people, it really starts to get a feeling, hey, we've got traction here. We can get a building, we've got a band, we can have a Sunday school, we've got a women's department, a youth department, you know. Things are just starting to get traction. Um, some of the early writers on this called that the possibility churches. It's the, we go, wow, we're actually, you know, with an aeroplane, we're coming down the runway, and then it starts to lift. So we start to say, we're, we're established, we're a go it's happening, here we go. Then the fourth the fourth level is what we call the credibility level. And this is where it is most dangerous for churches because what happens in the credibility level is when a church reaches somewhere between 200 and 500, it can do most things by itself. You've got a missions program. You've probably planted a couple of churches. You've got a great youth thing. You don't need any other church to help you or even be turn up to your camp. Because, you know, if you run a men's camp, you're going to get 100 guys turn up. So who needs anyone else? Right? And, that's, and then what happens is because you are in that zone, you start to get invited. And then at this point, I find a lot of pastors don't know whether they're an itinerant evangelist or a senior minister of a church. And we have to help them there. Basically, to say, stay home. Right. Anyway. Um, that happens here, too. But anyway, we, we won't talk about that, right? So... Birthing, establishing credibility. This is just the terminology I've given it. You could put other terminology to it. Then, once a church breaks through 500, we call that the fruitful zone. Now, that's not to say these aren't fruitful. That, that's not the issue. What we're, we're looking at the individual church here. Okay. Once a church breaks through this 500 zone and starts to grow to 1,000 plus, the true vision starts to really happen. Because you've got the money, you've got the people, 
Usually the pastor has developed the skills of leadership to keep it together. It's highly unlikely there's going to be a division that's going to split the church. Do you know a lot of splits happen around here? No splits in churches actually happen 75 to 200. Very rarely do you find a 1,000 plus church has a massive split and they go three ways. Very rare. Why? Because to lead a church at that level, the leadership of that church, not just the pastor, but the key leaders in that church are actually functioning in a leadership role. So it's led, it's stro there's strong leadership, whereas here leadership hasn't quite happened. And so it's very easy to splinter and take people away. And so there's an issue happening all the time here. It's, a very, it's like a new child. You know, a child's born and a ch children, they're vulnerable. But once people get into adulthood, even though bad things can happen or things can happen in their world, usually adults tend to cope because we've got a bit more maturity, maturity, hopefully. So then what I found was you can lay then the four personalities over this and you find the, set, the birthing is actually the phlegmatic or pastoral. So how do you start a church? You start in a phlegmatic pastoral mindset. You do everything. You visit everyone. You love them. You, you run everything. You're it. Right? Then we found the second, the second one was called the sanguine or the, that's the wrong spelling, sanguine or the, um, the preaching or the, uh, we, I'm using a biblical term there or idea, um, the communication. So in other words, what happens here is for a church to go beyond the phlegmatic phase into the establishing phase, the leader has to get better at promoting, communicating the vision. And the reason for it is here, this group is also called, by a lot of church growth experts around the world, the primary group. Okay, so the, the reason it's called the primary group is there is a small group of people that basically run that church. It's usually the pastor and his wife and one or two other friends and key people that are with them and they run it and it's the primary group. To break through and become a 200 church, the primary group's got to be dismantled. And often that is too hard for some pastors to negotiate that. How can I say to my friend who's an elder, you're no longer going to be an elder because this church has outgrown you and you're a pastor so instead of being an elder or a board member or a leader, right, I want you now to be involved in shepherding and caring for people. Or in a smaller church, the pastor needs a holiday, so he uses one of his friends to do a bit of preaching. He does well in front of 30 people. But now there's 150 people. He, he, it's, it's, he's a small group communicated. You see that? So the primary group, if it's not dismantled, becomes a major blocking point of growth here through to 200 and a lot of churches are held captive by usually a couple of friends maybe an elder or a money a person who's given a lot of money early so you have to start doing what he doesn't want and that gets really kind of weird um, anyway that, it varies so it's quite interesting churches breaking through then we found this area was known as the choleric Co uh, I always spell this wrong and I've written it so many times Choleric. <coughs> Why choleric? Because that's the phase where you've got to organize your church. To take a church from 200 to 500, if it doesn't get organized, you've got a dog's breakfast happening. You'll have duplication, waste of resources, everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes, it's the book of judges. <laughs> All right? That takes a major leap across here. Okay. Then the final stage, well, it's not the final, but under 99.5% of all churches, we call this the melancholy phase. Melancholy stage. And the reason that's called melancholy is that the leader of a 500 to 1,000 plus church has to be holistic, reflective. Um, there are multiple groups, multiple, multiple departments, and that leader has to have the ability 
to pull all those together and harmonize, hence the word holistic. Okay? That idea. And, and so seeing the whole, and that's another whole journey, right, to go to, which is really important. So if we go back now and we go to the first quadrant, let's summarize. 75 less, it's described by likable, sociable, relatable, easygoing, diplomatic, it's pastoral. <coughs> now, can you see this relates to small groups in your church? So in our church, we two and a half thousand members now in our church, we have to have a whole network of small groups. We teach them how to be pastoral, phlegmatic, likable, sociable, run a lot of events include people, love on them. Don't try to run a Bible school or a praise meeting in your small group. Run a primary group. Right? And we've lowered the bar and you get more people putting their hands up to be small group leaders, right? So this, as you grow, this doesn't stop. So, you know, it's like this, you know, so here's time and you start as a primary group. Then along here you break through 200 and then you break through 500. All these things are happening all the way through, right? But to go to the next level, you can't keep doing that. That's called insanity. You're, you're doing the same thing, expecting a different result. So it's not going to happen, right? And so that's the primary group. So let's look at this then. 51% of all churches are under 75. 51%. I call them small group churches or pastoral. The second, the sanguine quadrant, warm, friendly, enthusiastic, promoting the church. Why is that necessary? Because instead of having two or three small groups, you've got now, say, five or six. And you've got to pull them together or glue them. I call it gluing them. Otherwise, they all go in their own direction. Now, I know a pastor uh, in Australia who just can't do that. He's had three splits since I've known him. What happens is he starts off and he helps people and promotes them and they get moving and they get a whole lot of ministries happening and then because he doesn't do this, he doesn't glue it, he doesn't promote it, we're all going in the same direction, we've got all the same, isn't it exciting to be part of our church? Why, this is the greatest church to be involved in and you're in it and I'm in it and go in all sanguine in the pulpit, right? <laughs> he won't do that. And so what's happened is he's had several people rise up and then they get to about 30 people and they think, wait a minute, I've got half the church here. I could start my own. So they go out and they start their own. And I know one of the splits, they're still a primary group church. So now we've got two primary group churches. And I heard recently that pastor's having a few problems. Right? Because they haven't got into the leadership model, they're not bringing the church together as one. This is what this is about. It's bringing the church together as one. And to do it, you've got to be a salesman. Now, the moment you tell a phlegmatic to sell, they go, well, wait a minute. I'm me. They don't like me the way I am. There's the door. And I say, well, that's what they're doing. They're going to the door because you won't promote. Right? And, and so this is a critical stage because 51% of our churches are there. So how do we help these pastors get through this? We've got to help them learn sanguine styles, right? To get up in the pulpit and be enthusiastic. You know? So when I'm running a small group, my own, I've got a small group. I run my own small group in my church. It's called my D group. It's the top 10 guys in my church that run my world. And I hold it in my home. Or we go out to a restaurant. When I'm in my home, I put my shorts on and my footy jersey and watch some footy. Especially if the All Blacks beat the Aussies. Um, and, you know, we're, which hasn't happened a lot, but it is starting to happen. So don't choke on us, please. But anyway, I won't go there. It's bad for me to go there. I'm under pressure here. I said to Dean Sweetman in Auckland, mate, you need to make sure the All Blacks win. You need to start praying because I, my life will be hell for the next five years. Please, okay, please. So we joke about it. So I have a D group, but what I'm trying to say is that's how I dress and I, I have the coffee on. You know what I'm trying to say? I'm low-key, I'm friendly, right? When I get in a pulpit, I don't do that. 
What I find is a lot of pastors try to run a D group in the pulpit, and then they wonder why it doesn't work. See? So when you get in the pulpit, there's the need now to switch into a different style. Not, not a different personality, but a different style. You say, right, I'm in the pulpit now. I'm, I've got a message from God. This is exciting. So I say to people, when you're in the D group, flag out on them. Loving them, likable, hospitable, hey, cool, one-on-one, -on -one, warm and fuzzy, right? <laughs> Pulpit, upper level. Dress up. Get the band in order. Get the music up. <coughs> Don't have depressing music. Have up positive. Get the thing going, you know? Get people up in the pulpit that are bright and See, now, all, the moment that happens, people go, wow, we're, we're not just in a small group. We're part of a church now. Yeah. See, so you're moving from a small group mentality to a congregational model. So what happens here is this is the congregation. Well, some folks here that are not senior pastors. Yeah. But this, what, what excites me is that this so, uh, 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 works in a small yeah. department. Yeah. Totally. So, yeah, just yeah. if you want to. Totally. Yeah. Two and a half thousand members in our church, right, as I said before. I need vibrant D groups or small groups, whatever you call them, all over the church, right? So I don't want them to I don't want to teach them how to be sanguines. I want to teach them how to run effectively a pastoral care network in the church, you see? Very good point. Okay. But here's another thing. Say you're a youth pastor and you've got 30 people, don't try to copy, copy Hillsong or <laughs> Oxford Falls Christian City Church or our church. You know, our church on a Friday night, 400 youth, it's rocking, your heart's moving in your chest. It's a concert. It's like, you know what I mean? So I go into a church with 50 people in the youth group and they're trying to do that. They say, no, no, they don't do that. Do this. Run a whole lot of small groups and do things together and build fellowship and communicate, right? Once you get 75, 80, now you need to start in a smaller scale, go in there. But we have, a, we have traditional models. See, this is how I started my church, okay? Moved into Brisbane, bought a home or rented a home, got a job, hired a hall, bought an overhead projector, started a meeting. And wrong model. Put an advert in the paper. Took me a year to get 30 people, right? So what we do now... We send young guys out. We say, go into your city or your town that you're going to live in. Don't have church for a year. Get a job. Meet people. Start some small groups. Wow. When you get 50 people, then start a service. Okay? What it's done is it's released our guys from day one having to get rent and bands and music and all the hassle, I just say, go flag on them. Go love them, go care for them, and get about 50 people. So when you run a meeting, your first meeting, you've got 30 plus at it. Whereas I went there, I had seven. It was a nightmare. And the discussion between my wife was, do we put eight seats out or 12? What are we believing God for today? I did that. I lived it, man. I was the dream. But it was a nightmare, not a dream. And now I see young guys. Like we just sent out a young guy three years ago to start a church from scratch. We gave him no money, no people, nothing. And we just said, you're going to go out and get a job in the area. So he did, um, you know, um, what do they call it? You call it an Aussie um, um, executive training. So he'll go to a company and say, what training do you need? And they'll say, well, we need our guys to do some sales training or we need management training or, hey, our guys have no first aid, so can we do a first aid course? You know, whatever. He's got all these sets of courses with the companies with. He goes in and does it. So I said, you go there and do that job for a year. You do not take a salary from the church. Okay? Start small groups. So he goes into there, starts a small group, starts networking. Probably out of our church in the end, he took about 12 people. That's a good result for me. And uh, he goes in with his 12 people and he starts a small group. And then he's got two groups. He's got one on a Tuesday night and one on a Thursday night. And then he gets into the uni and he discovers a whole lot of people in the uni. So he starts a Saturday night youth group. But it's really like a small group, about 30 kids. That grew to like 50. 
And then he had that. So in six months, he comes to me and he goes, hey, Gordon, I've got 50-odd people, you know. I reckon I'll start a service. He said, go for it, mate. From day one, he started tithing. So anyone that was a member, he started up a church bank account and people are tithing into it. From day one, we haven't given him one dollar. He's now got a building fund. He's been three years. He's got 250 in the church. Right? So we're sort of modeling this new thing. Right? So it's really important that we understand that we have models of way of doing things that we need to really rethink and go, is that the way we ought to be doing it? You know, uh, and, and be challenged by it and invigorated by it. Because I find it quite invigorating when I see a young guy like that doing the reverse to what I did it. But that's all I knew. And then you see him do better than me. I think, man, that's awesome. There's a son because he's like one of my spiritual sons. His wife, we led to Christ. He joined. He was very young, 16 when he came. And, you know, they've been with us all these years. And now to see him succeed, it's the greatest delight. You know, um, so very important. Thank you. Good point. That led to a whole lot of other stuff, didn't it? Okay, so 34% of all churches are in this zone. Which means 85% of all churches are less than 200. 85%. So in other words, these are multiple small group churches. This is a primary small group church. These are multiple small group churches. And so the whole focus in this quadrant, if you put them together, is ministry. Is this helping anybody? Okay. I'm enjoying myself. It's okay. Right. So let's, let's just get rid of the stuff. All right, so we're a bit clean because it gets to look a bit like spaghetti by the time I finish. What I want you to do with your pen is do this. Colour it in. What is the hardest thing to do? Start a church? Not nah, easy. Heaps of people are doing it and have done it. What is the hardest thing I believe in the Christian church today? To take a church from two, to take a church through the 200 barrier or ceiling. Why? Statistically, 85% of all churches are not breaking through the 200 barrier. There are other reasons that I believe, but we can talk about it later. Ah, I'll talk about it now. In Australia, around 84% of the population are phlegmatic sanguines. We like this sort of church. So when a person starts to be a choleric on us, we don't like that. Now, this doesn't happen here. This is, these are your Kiwis, right? This is what Aussies do. Hey, Jay, I know you're looking after these 12 young people. Here's a pastoral report form. We'd like you to fill it out and bring it to me once a month and we'll have an accountability meeting, okay? Well, don't you trust me? Why do I have to start filling out a form now? Is this getting professional? What's going on down here? And then you get all this stuff and you think, where did that come from? And so what I find in the body of Christ is there's all this lip service to submission and there's none. Now, I know I'm singing to the choir here probably. <laughs> But it starts with us, because I ask you, who are you accountable to? I had to ask myself that question. I say, yeah, well, I learn from others, but I do what I feel God wants. That's called rebellion. <laughs> we give a lot of lip service to submission. All right? So what we want in our churches is we want the pastor to visit us to be the phlegmatic and we want the pastor to feed us and entertain us on Sunday and we'll be happy. Once the pastor starts telling me what to do and what not to do, he's controlling me, isn't he? And in the New Zealand-Australian psyche, we've got, a re we've got a reaction to that. Look at the way we treat our, our political leaders. 
It's a cultural thing. What I'm trying to say here is I've discovered the, one of the first reasons that stop us from breaking that is cultural. It's got nothing to do with the Lord or demons or anything. We are living in a culture that is uh, predisposed toward a ministry mindset. We like it. Now, my initial comments. Here's this predisposition. Now take the charismatic culture that is huge. It is still with us, even though we call ourselves Pentecostals. Ministry-itis. And put it on top. Now you've got two layers. You've got a natural, let's just call it Aussie mentality. Now you've got a spiritual mentality that goes, you're correct. Now, thirdly, we have now developed a whole lot of theological reasons why churches ought to be small. And so we have personality thing, cultural thing, we have a spiritual experience thing, and then we have a whole lot of theology that we dump on the top. And then you as a pastor are expected to get, turn choleric and lead this church somewhere. You're pushing a snowball uphill. I just thought I'd bless you. I'll, I will not be that negative all day, okay? But it's the reality. And when I saw it, it was a light bulb, I went, it's not me. <laughs> I'm not the problem. We're the problem. I didn't say them, I said we. We're Aussies, you know. Because I've got to be an Aussie, you know, even though they won't let me, any, whatever. That released me. I hope that releases you today. See, you've got to understand your culture and the market that you're trying to penetrate. So that'll help you now, if you understand that, how to negotiate Jade to get him following and accountable. And I've discovered it's got less to do with systems and requirements, and it's got more to do about building a culture of accountability. So a culture is harder to develop than a system. System, I get on the Mac, print it out, do that. But if he's not imbibing the culture of doing that, the piece of paper is a waste of time. Yeah. See what I'm trying to say? Yeah. So it's building this idea of mutual submission and cooperation, and we go from there, yeah. right? Also in our cultures, we have an acute... Fanatic, uh, that's the wrong word. I was going to say fanaticism. You don't tell me what to do. I'm my own person, and I'm a Western, free, moral being. <laughs> you know? And Pentecostals are the worst at it, and I love being a Pentecostal. I'm committed to it, and I tell our church we're Pentecostal to the core. We speak in tongues. We believe in healing. I'm into it. But I'm also aware that the downside of that is everyone hears from God. <laughs> <laughs> and I've discovered in the Christian church that when someone tells me they're praying about it, they're basically telling me to get stuffed. <laughs> but because we're Christians, we're not going to say get stuffed. We go, I'll pray about it. <laughs> And you might as well give me the fingers. You might as well say, rack off, mate. I ain't going to do it. And I've seen it. And, and so I'm like it. It's not like I'm preaching at people. I know I've come to the realization that I've been like that. It's in our culture. We're individuals. We're individualistic rather than the team. Okay. So what am I saying? Well, we need to spend more time building the culture to make this happen. Now, the reason I'm just spending a bit of time on this is this is huge. If, 80, if 84 plus percent of us don't like that naturally, <laughs> how are we going to go there? And when we go there, it feels wrong. But what right have I got to expect Jade to turn up to church if he's a leader half an hour before service, right? And he's busy. You know what I'm saying? You know? And you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just try to 
ask him nicely and help him. And we, we do this dance through the tulips. You know, we do. And, you know. So, well, you should do. But, um, but uh, you know, you've got to go to the place where you say, Jay, look, do you want to be a leader? You fill this out. Oh, I don't want to. Then you're no longer a leader. The first time I said it, I thought, this is bad. And I had all the theology. What right have you got to deny him of his ministry? All this stuff goes on in your head. Right? But So it was a journey for us. But now in our church, if you don't fill out accountability forms, if you don't submit to the leadership, you ain't going to lead in our church. It's the way it is. And the good thing now is I don't have to say it. Because I'm up here, you see. I've got a whole team of cholerics now, and it's their job, you know. But that's just the future for a number here. But that's just taking that journey, and it's so tough, I know, I, it, the cringe factor. But it's, it's not just giving the paper. Don't, it, systems will not build your church or do this. But it's now talking to Jay and the other leaders about what it means to submit. What is submission? How does that work? And it's not this heavy kind of, you know, that he can't have an opinion or whatever, you know. It's getting it there. Okay? Fraser, you had a question. Are you saying that it is just that all should be able to go into this next stage? Or, in other words, is there, you know, some of 60-fold, 80-fold, 100-fold? Is there anything, do you look at that at all, about the actual capacity of leaders? Yep. To lead a certain amount? You know? Yeah. So are you in this saying that we should all be able to break through that, or are you saying that some are stuck in those first two bears they're not willing to? Or okay, the answer to that is yes and no. Okay. Yep. Um, my idealistic, slightly melancholy side would say everyone can do it, because this is just a style. But the other way to put it is this. No matter who we are, where we are, what we're doing, we all have a limit to our current attitude, approach, skill set. All of us, doesn't matter who we are. I've got a limit on me right now that I'm busting through two and a half thousand. I'm trying to bust through, you know, I need three million dollars in the next six months for a building extension. That's not a building, that's just an extension, right? So I've got, if I stay where I'm at, that's going to be this mountain. So I've got to go to a new level. So, yes, I believe everyone can go to a new level, right? But B, we all have limits, and I think what happens when we reach that limit, we do one of two things. We just continue forever in that paradigm and never change, or eventually it wears us out and we leave. And I think that's what's happening a lot around the body of Christ. Now, say you're here and you break through to there, you may never be able to break through to there. I get what you're saying. And I probably agree with that. Now, that's where Gordon Moore can get a bit controversial. Um, my feeling is that if a person is just a primary leader, they shouldn't really be leading a church. They should be leading maybe an outreach or satellite of an apostolic leader who's here. Do you, you understand what I'm trying to say? We've got a number of those in New Zealand. Say, for instance, you've got an evangelist, awesome soul winner, leading heaps to Christ, but not growing the church. So in other words, you've got this huge front door, and he's got a huge back door. Okay? Put that leader as a satellite, so it's still called a church, and it's still functioning as a church in the community, the actual fact, what you've done is you've made that church now a satellite of this apostolic center, right? The back door starts to close. Now, they might not all stay in that church, but they get involved in other ministries in the bigger setting. Okay? So we've actually done that. We've had other guys, one guy I'm thinking of in particular, going for 20 years, kids burning out, wife just frustrated to the core, no money, no holidays, right? So we tried to do that for him. And I actually found a pastor that was prepared to underwrite his salary because he had an evangelistic gift on him. Awesome. 
He led people to Christ like you, he'd just leave a lot of people for dead. So he needs to be out in something like that, just winning people to Christ, right? But be part of an apostolic yeah. um, setting. Oh, man, it went down like a lead balloon. Man, it just, it just went, it went pear-shaped on us. I couldn't even discuss it with him. He got so upset. I've been a pastor, and just because I've got 75, you're the big shot, and you come and telling us. That's not what it was about. We were tr de genuinely trying to help him, realizing that, as you say, Fraser, he had reached his ceiling, and, and, it look, and he was hearing all this and getting oversight and help, but he just couldn't break through. And then he got more frustrated, but then he blamed us. But then when we offered him this situation, he wanted to be his own man. So in the end, we had to say, well, mate, that's what you want to do. You go do it. It's a free will. You know, we're not here to rule over you if that's what you want to do. But I, we're just offering you something here. So what we've found in our movement, we've found a lot of churches in that situation um, are really keen to develop that relationship with an apostolic center. And then we've gone a step further. And now we won't allow anyone to plant a church that isn't part of an apostolic center. And then we brought in the 75 rule that says you cannot be an official church until you've broken through 75. So that means... If you minister for the next 20 years with 50 to 75 people, healthy church, winning people to Christ, you know, etc., you can't do it on your own. You have to be part of an apostolic centre that's going to resource you and fund you and look after you. And we've found that fantastic. It's absolutely really worked. Okay. I'd like to raise it to 200, but it's a bit of a leap yet. We'll do that in a leap year, maybe. You, you can see where I'm coming from. Can you imagine getting as many churches just over here, the impact that's going to have? Yeah. And there's a, there's a whole lot of theology, not theology, ideas on it that I have. But when I first brought in the 75 limit, that put the cat among the pigeons, I'm telling you. you know, you're just grouping us, you know. You're, just, you're not interested in the little guys. So then that sends my flag to the top of the flagpole because I spend most of my time helping small churches. Most of my ministry, most of our budget in our denomination goes to these guys. These guys get nothing. <coughs> they pay for it all. And I have guys in small churches getting all itchy and uptight, and I say, mate, don't complain with your mouth full. <coughs> you know, you're getting helped here. And for nothing. If your church grows and you break through, they're not going to say, wow, Gordon Moore was this great guy that did it. You know what they're going to say? Yeah. This guy, look what he's doing. And I'll be there cheering him on. Because yeah. I want the kingdom to grow. I want churches to grow, you see. Yeah. So this is a, I don't know how we got here. It's, it's a big mindset, Fraser. But I've come in my life despite all of that. I would say that most of my time, I'm actually helping and resourcing these smaller churches. And we've seen great results, mind you. Incredible results, yeah. You can sneak through, can't you? without going through the choleric stage if you've got significant ministry gift. Ah, we've got some bright people in this room. Mm -hmm. that will have you can have a thousand size church yeah. that's functioning in the yeah. second quarter. Yeah. But it'll have implications, won't it? You wanna have huge implications because it's yeah. not empowering leadership. It's all revolving around a highly gifted, whoops, nearly went, a high, highly gifted sanguine style leader. I can name a few, but I won't. <laughs> and it's great. And some people just love that sort of church. Yeah. Me? I don't think I'd like to be part of it, personally. I'd like to be in a church that was more empowering. Mm. Yeah. So what you'll find in a church like that is it revolves around the Sunday morning meetings, great events, but probably very little pastoral work which is really interesting. Now, Matt, um, you're mature people, aren't you? <laughs> I think that's the American model. Yeah. And if you've traveled and been there, you'll know what I'm saying. So in other words, you have a highly gifted oratory, prophetic teaching style ministry. You hire administrator 
who basically looks after all the money and the basic events in the church. That's, that's, how the, that's the model. And I think that influence has got on a lot of the Australia and New Zealand church, especially in Australia. But let me reiterate my words, Nigel. <coughs> Sooner or later, that person will hit his limit. There will be a ceiling. We all have ceilings. Business people have ceilings. So if you're running a business, if you're a business person, you will have a productivity ceiling. And all of us know, whether it's business or church or whatever, when you reach that ceiling, you have to start doing business different. If you keep working harder, you're going to wear out. So there has to be a re-evaluation. Usually that's where you get consultants or you go for further training, you upgrade your skills or learn new skills. Then you go again and your business takes off. That's in the business world. I've lectured this to business people. You know, because a guy starts out as a plumber, great plumber, and then he hires a couple of staff because he sells himself. And he's got his card and he does a great job and he's got a little folder together, you know. And then the problems start. Because he can't go to this level. Timesheets, productivity, business plans, blah, blah, blah. And then he finds he's just running around, putting out fires, and he says, I just ought to work by myself. And I've met a lot of contractors that go... I'm firing everybody and I'm going back for a one-man operation because it's just too painful. What is he saying? I've, I'm not prepared to go there. You know, big companies hire guys just to do this. They're called project managers. They earn big money. And all they do, they go around and keep builders or project people, sales people, whoever, on budget, on time, according to the vision and the culture and the policies of the company, that's all they do. Now, what I'm saying is in a church, the first leap is for you and me as the pastor to be that project manager. But then as we get into this zone, we then appoint other people to be the project managers over this. So it's not like this stops, but what happens is actually you've got to do more of this to grow your church, but you won't get any more by you being focused on just doing it. You've got to go here and then you get them to do it, and, and so forth. That's the empowering leadership quadrant. Yes, sir. What's your name? Andrew. Andrew. What you're saying is really good. I, I love what you're saying. Um, a few thoughts. You're coming from the presumption that the goal of every church is to become 500 or 1,000 plus. Uh, so you're trying to move people around. Um, I, I wouldn't say that's the goal. Yeah. I'm saying that's how statistics worldwide defines them. Okay. But I would agree with you. I think part of the theology, remember we talked about the overlays down, it's weighting the church down. The theology, there is a lot of theology or thinking in the Christian world that I don't want to do that anyway. I'm here just to minister and serve the Lord or whatever. And I'm not into numbers. But I say to guys like that, oh, you're not in the numbers. Did you count your offering? Oh, well, of course I count them offering. <laughs> you know, people count their money, but they won't count their people. And then they tell me they're not into numbers. It's like, oh, that's convenient. See? So I, but see, the goal of my church is not numbers. The goal of my church is actually viability and health. The goal of our church is to fulfill our vision, not reach a numerical goal. But you see, numerical goals are the yardstick by which I know I'm reaching that vision. Uh, let me illustrate, because this is a good point you've raised. I go to the, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, come on Andrew, we're thinking here today, if I can get you just thinking, if that's all I do, and you know, man, this is awesome, because I find there's not enough thinking in the church, but it won't go there, um, if I go, to, I go to the doctor once a year, from the time I turned 40, my doctor said, Gordon, I want to see you every year, you are, you, are, you are employed in one of the highest stress jobs in the world, he said, I want to see you every year, and we do the full thing. So I walk into the room, I sit down, it's like a routine, it's boring. Slaps it on. <laughs> Writes it down, numbers. So I go like this, he goes, I just want to take the cell. Oh no, I'm not into numbers. I, I want you to mystically pray over my health. What do you think? Look into my eyes and just say, what do you think? Just say, oh brother. 
Okay, she can go now. He's well. He's going to run numbers like you wouldn't believe. I then have to go down and get these vials of blood, like about, what, three or four of them? You've done the big test, right? He, he does everything. Do you know it doesn't come back as a nice apple picture of my body and my blood? He gets a sheet with numbers, and he goes through, and he'll go, and last time I went, I'd just come back in from overseas. Like, I'm not going to see him after this, mate. I've been eating so many oysters, you wouldn't believe. And seafood, man. Man, you're in heaven. Anyway, whatever. Um, so I went after a trip, and he did my numbers, and my cholesterol was slight high, and he had the number. And he's got my numbers for like 20 years. He says, Gordon, I just up, but he said, that's unusual. He said, he said, let's leave it at six months and come back again. He said, it might not be a problem, but you might need to just cut down. And he said, I said, yeah, I've probably been taking a bit too much cheese and oysters and things. Whatever, you know. He said, well, you have to cut back. I said, you're trying to kill me? <laughs> you know. So he does my numbers, you see. So you know the first thing I do when I go into consult a church? I have people that are maybe a pastor get a call. He said, Gordon, I think I need help. I won't even see that person until I get a readout of all his numbers. I want to know what his attendance is, what his membership is, what his fallout rate is, what his conversion rate is, what his money. I want to know, and I want charts, and I want stats. Because you see, my doctor, is his goal to get my numbers? Now what's his goal? My health, my viability as a human being, right? But you see, you don't know what my viability is until you look at my numbers. And we've just got to get over this in the kingdom of God. We've got to get over this in the church. And I get really worried when I meet pastors and they don't keep stats. I live by the black line. Every Tuesday, I get sent the guts of our church. How many visitors? Every department are numbered. And I track it. This is this holistic thing, because I'm here. So what I do here is I live by numbers. And if money's down, have a guess what I'm doing next week? I'm preaching on money. And I'm in there, man, and I'm preaching. And I'm the sanguine in the pulpit. When I'm going through here, I'm the melancholy, I'm worried. Taking some medication, because the money's going down. But when I get up in the pulpit, I'm going to raise the finance for the kingdom of God. Amen. I'm going to speak boldly about it and bring people on board. And have a guess what happened? The money tips up, right? souls they start going down our church we have about average of seven or eight a week come to christ every week in the life of our church right okay the moment that goes down to six or five have a guess what i'm doing a series on but you say wait a minute we're not moving into that i don't care what you're moving into i'm not after doing my favorite sermon or what i think they need to get i've got to make sure the health of the church is right because when the health's right everything else is flowing right and so my job as the senior minister or leader of the church is to make sure the church is healthy. Because when that's healthy, they're happy. And when they're happy, they've got energy. Right? So, so this, is, like, this is huge. And I reckon you create, Andrew, I probably got away from your question, you create all of this culture here. And I think one of the problems we've got in the body of Christ is I come here and start talking to guys, they go, man, I've got to go home and do that now but they haven't been doing it here so when andrew my young pastor went out to start his church i said from day one anyone who visits anyone give them a piece of paper make them accountable from day one start it from day one so when you get here and you go hey we're tightening things up they go great because part of the culture and i think what happens in churches churches get to this point and hit a ceiling for a few years and think man and then, so then they read my book saying, they go, man, I've got to get organized and hold people accountable. And then there's a reaction and they wonder why. Well, there's not a culture. You see what I'm trying to say? So I'm going to the church now for $3 million. I've announced it. I said, we're going to build, we're going to extend the building by $3 million. I haven't got people hemorrhaging. <laughs> He's asking for money. I built a culture of giving in our church, right? One guy said to me, when do building funds end, Gordon? Never. Because as long as there's a healthy church and we're winning on people to Christ, we're going to have to keep building and extending. Yeah. All right? So you create that culture. You see what I'm saying? So this is a really important question. You know? So numbers are, numbers are like this, you see. You know, it's like a ruler. You know? But the purpose and values which are interpreted into goals, 
that's where we're going. But if you can't make a goal into a numerical value, well, how do you know you're reaching this? Right? So, for instance, people say, how's your church going? Mate, the anointing in our church is best ever. What do you mean by that? Presence of God, mate. We've had people falling down. We've had... It's there. So then I ask a few questions. How many converts resulted in that increased anointing? Oh, none. Okay, so zero. Okay. How many new members? Um, none. How many left the church? How many exits were there? Don't know. Well, so how do you know the anointing's increased? Oh, we just feel it. I'm trying to get pastors away from that paradigm into, I know the anointing's increasing in our church. We've had 10 healings in the last month. Right? I know my youth leader is the right man for the job, anointed for the job, because since he took over, 20 new young people have joined our young people's group. See, so, so, you, so, you know, we, we've had this all the time. So, just contending with it and talking with it, and, and it's not an easy road, but this is what I've found. If we don't go here, you can forget this. So, all you do is spend your whole life ministering, visiting, counselling, caring for people. Now, hey, in answer to Fraser's question, if you're happy with that, that's great. But I got a feeling that we all want our churches to grow. <laughs> so, you know, I think growth is a paradigm of the kingdom. That's what I believe, theologically. I'm committed to that. I believe I ought to grow as an individual. I'm 55 years of age, and I ought not to stop growing. Right? And I meet 55-year-olds. 50 years, oh, well, I can't wait to stop and do nothing. Man, uh, how can you live like that? How selfish. Man, I feel like a mosquito that's just turned up at a nudist colony. I don't know where to start. <laughs> the anticipation of fulfillment is overawed by the magnitude of the opportunity. It's like, you know what I'm trying to say? Life we've got to get, it's like, you know, it's exciting. And I think if we get our churches somehow into that zone, it kind of, but this takes a lot of teaching and preaching and talking. And, you know, we've had, we've had whole retreats where the whole subject is the purpose and value of our church. That's what we talk about. Who are we? What do we do? We, we spend a lot of money and time talking about who's our market. Church is trying to win everybody. Well, the facts are not everyone likes me to start with. So they're going to come to my church. They're going to walk into my church, hear me preach, and go, oh, I don't like them. Fine. Not everyone's going to like our church or your church. But who will? Who are they? What do they look like? How old are they? Where do they work? Where do they live? Um, are they educated? Are they not educated? But what we tend to do as church is just try to minister to everybody. I'm not trying to minister to everybody. I'm trying to minister to a very narrow section of our community. I guess you've heard of John Lewis, who's just retired. Tired? Have you heard of John Lewis, the AG guy? He had one of the biggest churches up until recent years in definitely Queensland and Northern Australia. Great guy, retired. You know what his passion is? Education. He's got this huge school complex, primary. My granddaughter goes. Heaps of our kids go. So I'll do it. No, 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 no. You've got to know your purpose. See? And really nail that. So we're reaching middle, upper, educated, northern Brisbaneites. So we don't have a... Love shop, we don't have food parcels, we don't have, 
We don't reach people that if I bring them into our church is going to destroy our church. And this comes down to the Peter Wagner idea of the homogenous group. And I used to preach against that when I was younger because I was idealistic. But what I've come to understand is you cannot reach everyone in a splintered, fragmented culture. Right? So you know the old song by the um, Sesame Street? Who are the people in your neighborhood? Who are you called to reach? So this comes down to this. Because what happens if that's all I've got? My goal is to be 500. Oh, brother, that's not a good game to get into. That's, you're going to have to have a bigger vision than 500. You know, my whole goal was to get to 500 when I went to Australia. I thought, if I get to 500, I'll retire. When I got there, I was so blinking frustrated because I had 500 people. I needed more staff. I needed a bigger building and that and that and that and that. And that. A thousand. If I just get to a thousand, I'll be happy. Then you get to a thousand, and then you need a two million dollar building, and then you're even more frustrated. You see what I'm trying to say? So I'm not motivated by that at all. My vision is to build the church, and I have five core values that I will not surrender on: preaching, songs, colour of the wall. Who cares? You can change those systems. Change them. And I think that's a great need. If we know our purpose and our values, that's where we're going, right? This, the numbers, they are measuring sticks to see where we're going, right? See, to do what I'm doing now, I couldn't be a pastor of a church that big because I wouldn't have enough money. I wouldn't have other people to do. So when I'm away, I've got a whole team of people doing things, you see, so... So our vision is to empower other churches. Part of our calling, we believe, is to, to be an apostolic center. And so that's what God's called us to do. It's not part of our purpose, but it's part of the vision of what God's led us into. And I know to do that, I have to have a certain dynamic of church. So I've got to measure it, don't I? So if I start losing people, have a guess what I'm going to start losing? Tides and salvations and then thing goes backwards and then I'm, then I'm in a situation where I have to start cutting staff and then I won't be able to fulfill this. So it's a huge issue, this, about your purpose and your values. May I suggest a book? Uh, Jim Collins, he's a business writer, he's a Christian guy and he writes for the secular markets called Built to Last. And he'll help you define your purpose and your values. Very good. Because I used to have a vision statement, mission statement, <coughs> Culture, values, I had them all on the wall, man. And guys said, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, then I read Jim, William, uh, Jim uh, Collins and he says, three words, four words at most, your purpose. Don't take vision, get rid of vision. Purpose, what are we here to do? We got meetings together, we brainstormed, got everyone on board. And really they said what I was going to say, which is awesome. <laughs> everyone agreed came round to what I actually was in my heart all along, to build the church. And by the church, I mean the local church. I don't mean everyone else's church. I mean the church that God's placed me in. Because theologically, I believe when I build the local church, I build the church. Yeah. Right? So that's a critical thing. So that, And then we came up with our five values. What are the five things that we're committed to and that we're here to fulfill? And then it takes care of this money, money numbers, right? <coughs> They're secondary. Because I think in people's thinking, when you start saying you've got to break through 200, they go, oh, but that's just numbers. No, no, no. It's a measuring stick or a definition of where the church is. And this is what this quadrant really helps, the four style of churches. But how do you know that if you don't count your members, if you don't believe in stats? And I find a lot of pastors are very fuzzy on this sort of stuff. And they don't even know how many members they have. You know, so it's kind of really important, this sort of stuff, working through it. How are we going for time? Another 10 minutes? Did you have another question, Andrew? I've got another question. I was just preambling. Yeah, OK. Forgive me for my preamble. <laughs> um, we're sort of in that tolerant sector, OK, as a church. Yes. I know, and I've also planted churches, so I've been over in that pragmatic sector. Mm -hmm. I know that the larger your church gets, the more it costs to run it. 
Anyway, that's a light bulb experience. But, but you see that <coughs> when you send people out, you, they have to grow 50 before they start. Now you're thinking of raising it to 200 before they start. <coughs> no, 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 no. No, what I was saying was you need about 50 people before you start a service in this quadrant. But before we release a church to being an independent church, a, an official church in our movement, I'd like them to be over 200. Now, you know the young guy I sent out? He's a bright spark, man. He's been around me and he's, you know, educated. <laughs> he goes, I, he, he said, can I have a coffee with you one day? And I thought, he's either going to ask me for money or something. I'll probably give it to him, but whatever. What, what's the deal? And he says, Gordon, he says, you know, you know the 75 level you've been talking about? I says, yeah. He says, I'm totally happy about it, but I just want to discuss it. He says, up to 75... I don't have to set up my own accounts. You'll take care of all of that. <laughs> and you're going to underwrite my church because I'm a department of your church, right? I says, yeah. <laughs> Not that that's going to happen, mate. No, no, but it is. It's the, that's the, oh, so I'm just describing it. That's it, right, right? I said, yeah. <coughs> he said, but you know, I've been reading your books again, just going over. You know, breaking through that 75, actually, and I've heard you say this in a seminar, by the way. That's easy or easier. He said, the real one is breaking through this zone. He said, what would you think if I stayed under you until I broke through 200? <laughs> I said, what's your reasoning? He says, well, I, I reckon at this stage, I haven't got enough money, time, or bother to have an eldership board meetings, take care of all the GST. <coughs> you can do all that for me. <laughs> In my head, straight away, I thought, He's going to build a good church. He's a sharp turkey, you know. <laughs> so, so, you know, I'm not going to refuse him. He's a son, you know. He's, he's been faithful in a church. I said, you can have it, mate. It's cost us thousands of dollars to actually look after him. And just this month, I said, right, 31st of August, buddy, you're on your own. <laughs> you know how you kick your kids out? It's like get a job, get a real life, you know. It's like, you know, and he's great about it and really excited. We're going to have a big celebration thing on it back home. Um, but... He's broken through. But now that statement you said, I'm just picking up that statement, it costs a lot of money. You know, it cost us quite a significant amount of money to actually do that. So about six months ago, my wife, who looks after all the operations, she said, we ought to charge him. I said, yeah, we ought to. So I went to him, because he's getting all his tithes and he's saving money. We're spending it, you know. <laughs> and so I said to him, uh, you know, all this time you're giving about our accounts department spends about three hours a week looking after you, checking up, you know, blah, blah, blah. We're going to charge you out at the going rate for that. He went, yeah, sure. No worries at all. Well, then about February, March, when I said you're on your own at June, we finally got it to August, it's happened. Um, <laughs> we had a meeting with the lawyer, went to the, you know, we go to the top of town lawyers um, to uh, get advice on this and how to set it up. And I thought I'd better clarify it as we left. I said, so how much is it going to cost, mate, to the lawyer? And he went, oh, it'll be a couple of grand. <laughs> I said, oh, you're paying for this, mate. We're not paying for it. It's, you know. And he goes, two grand? We got out, got in the car, and he goes, two grand to get that advice. I said, pay peanuts, hire monkeys. <coughs> you, you, you've got to get the right advice. So I'm trying to tr teach him stuff, you know. He says, man, it's a lot of money, isn't it? And I said, welcome to first grade, brother. <laughs> From now on, you're going to have to carry all this. So it is. And I think people underestimate that. Yeah. And it's a huge thing. Now, this was a journey for me, and it's not our subject, but you've raised it. Here's another light bulb for me, because I can hear you've got it. If you want to grow a church, you're going to have to raise a lot of money. Now, there's a theological nightmare. It sounds good, but I'll tell you what, even in my own thinking, how to raise money, how to go and ask people for money. The reality is, if you're going to build a large church, you're going to have to create an environment of generosity and giving, and you have to start talking about money. Yeah. And for the first time in my life, probably about 10 years ago, 
I really started to talk about money. But about five years ago, I got desperate. And I really talked about it. Because it's not been in my culture. I come from a blue-collar family. You know, so it's been a real journey for me. But that's a light bulb for me. To, to, churches cost a lot of money. Yet we have a mindset in the church. They're always talking about money. All they want is your money. You know. Why doesn't the church do it for free? So people go to the rugby club, pay their dues, pay for everything and play rugby. People go to the RSL or RSA, pay membership, pay for their food. Come to church, you pay. I've found I've had to change that. So we ought to be paying more in the church, not less. Isn't it God's church? Isn't it the house of God? Why should the church be second hand? Why should the church, you know, and just changing that mindset and talking about it, because it's that's a huge one. That's one of these. You know what usually happens around here? Buildings, usually. You know the day that happened? Actually, that happened to me here. We were renting a senior citizens hall for 40 bucks a week, and I got this bright idea. We've got growth. We're moving. God's with us. Everyone's in my team. They're with me. They love me. <coughs> Let's hire a warehouse. 400 a month. So we go from 40 to 100. The first morning, we painted it. We got it and got it all set up. The first morning that I turned up to church, 40 people left out of the 80, 90 people. Just gone. I thought, I mean, that wasn't a light bulb. <laughs> that was a four by two. Smack. And I thought, no. Then when, I, when the offering came in and we counted on the Monday, it had gone up. Okay. So then I thought, I'm going to visit these exit people which is something we do now to everyone who leaves our church. We actually visit them one-on-one -on -one and find out why they're leaving and how we can learn, because we might be at fault. Right? And I found they didn't believe in tithing or giving. And I found their leader had taken a vow of poverty. <laughs> a vow of poverty. So you see, the moment I started talking about a church, a building fund, a building, or whatever, they're freaking. But they're in the church sitting there, and we'd never talked about it. I'd never talked about it. That exit interview was like a 4 by 2 which was really good for me. I had to start talking about money and commitment and whatever. And you know, it was only within a few months, those people were all replaced. We never looked back. And then we went on and got another building and another one. And I learned that you just got to not take this personal. And that people are on a journey. And you can't win everybody. But it's exciting. You know, I wouldn't be doing anything else. There was one down the back. Yep. Do you personally know or do you know who's giving in your church and who's not giving? No. Nah. It depresses me too much. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm being very frank with you here. Is this okay? Oh, yeah, I know them. Because if they're not giving, they're not leaders. Okay. So I know who's giving in the building fund. And, but not tithing and giving, you know. I don't, I don't make it my business. But I want my business to know are the le Now, see, in, a, in my situation, it's slightly different. I require all my pastors or managers to know who's giving and not giving. Someone knows. I don't want to know. Because I find if I get up in the pulpit and I'm looking at Jay and I'm thinking he's one of my key leaders and he didn't give it to the Lincoln thing. I'm a, you know, it's, it gets too difficult. So I find it's far better to be naive. Yeah, yeah. What was that? That's good, Kerry. I really like that. Plausible deniability. It's very good. But I like to know who my key givers are. I know who the big givers are and I look after them. You betcha. I learnt that one. But you know, it's just a journey, isn't it? You know, and it's like, it's huge, this thing. It's, it's, uh... So we're going to have some lunch now, aren't we?
This is very good. I hope this has been helpful. And I hope it's opened up a few things. And um, we'll keep going this afternoon. And I haven't finished this yet because a few things we need to say. And um, probably we'll move on to talking about some of the foundational thinking that holds us back at every level. Can even hold back a two and a half thousand size church. Small church mentality doesn't mean these people think it. I've got people in my church that have small church thinking. They've got a small church mentality, doctrine, idealism. And they're in a large church, right? And so it's adjusting that and dealing with it and moving.